choosing and protecting safe relationships, the second pillar of recovery for scapegoat survivors. Do you find yourself in friendships or relationships where kindness is hard to come by? Do you avoid people who are good to you because you think they must not really know you or that there must be something wrong with them? And do you expect to be rejected if your opinion doesn't match the other person's? Well, scapegoat survivors of narcissistic parents may actually feel better when they are in one-sided relationships. And the reason goes back to how uncared for they felt as a child. They felt abandoned, astray, and ashamed. I will call these the three A's as we go along. To avoid the three A's, the scapegoat child had to find a way to not expect care from their narcissistic parent. The child may do this by adopting the belief that they are defective and undeserving while their parent is perfect and deserving. Now the child can conclude that they exist only to obey and admire their parent. So long as they are operating this way, then they can feel useful to their narcissistic parent. And feeling useful beats the three A's by miles. The scapegoat child internalizes this pattern of interaction with their narcissistic parent. And in so doing, they experience life as something that feels good when they are psychologically close to that parent and bad when they are not. Just as all children do too, it's just, it's just that the terms of this, what's being close versus not, are particularly excruciating for the scapegoat child. Staying close can mean acting like that parent is around and in charge, or it can mean treating oneself the same way the parent mistreated them. Scapegoat survivors do one or both by moving towards people who treat them like they do not deserve very much. Such friendships and relationships reinforce their internal connection to their narcissistic parent. And this internal connection staves off that ongoing threat of the three A's emerging. Reciprocal friendships and relationships can actually feel threatening to the scapegoat survivor at first. This is because being treated well can make them feel more distant from their internalized narcissistic parent. And if they feel distant, then they are at risk of feeling those three A's. These safe friends and partners may offer the care that was not available earlier in life. However, the past trauma of not having it available can initially flood the survivor with the three A's. This makes it very difficult at first to see that things are in fact different now. Well, in today's video, I explain how to apply the second pillar of recovery from narcissistic abuse in your life. And this pillar involves moving away from narcissistically abusive people and towards safe people. I'll also explain the challenge and the promise that this pillar offers. The challenge involves re-encountering the feelings of being ashamed, abandoned, and astray that resulted from going uncared for as a child while the promise involves a gradual realization that the care you need from others will no longer be withdrawn at any moment. And finally, I'll point you to a resource that can help you structure your life to help you meet this challenge and also realize this promise. Well, let me introduce myself and all three pillars of recovery. My name is Jay Reed, and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in California, and I specialize in recovery from narcissistic abuse. In my professional and personal experience, I've worked to identify the fundamentals to the process of recovery. And this has led me to what I call the three pillars of recovery. Pillar number one is making sense of what happened so that you know it wasn't your fault. Pillar number two is moving away from narcissistic abusers and towards safe people. And pillar number three is living in defiance of the narcissist rules. It's also essential to find and participate in communities of people who can get, validate, and support you on this path. I've both seen and experienced large improvements in quality of life after applying these pillars. I'd also like to mention that I'm offering a new free ebook called four ways to heal for adult scapegoat survivors. And in it, I offer four strategies to reclaim your authentic self from the fake and painful scapegoat identity, learn and apply the science behind gaining distance from narcissistic abusers, know the secret to reducing social anxiety for scapegoat survivors, and a strategy to accept yourself as the fallible and valuable person you are. You can find the link to the ebook in the description box below or by clicking here. 
how staying close to the internalized narcissistic parent protects the scapegoat child. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the scapegoat child is not sufficiently cared for. Their narcissistic parent does not show them love, but instead uses the child to maintain their own flagging self-esteem. In the case of the child thrust into the role of scapegoat, this means embodying the worthlessness that the narcissistic parent feels but can't tolerate in themselves. If the child cooperates, then they get to feel useful to the narcissistic parent. If the child doesn't cooperate and say expects to feel cared for uh, by the narcissistic parent, then that child's gonna feel something far worse. The child can come face to face with the utter absence of care that their narcissistic parent holds towards them. Such encounters can throw the child into one or more of those three A's. First is abandoned. The scapegoat child's healthy need to know that they are genuinely important to their parent tragically doesn't get met. Instead, they find a parent who isn't interested nor genuinely concerned about them. The scapegoat child may get some attention for superficial attributes. However, they feel utterly alone in their inner worlds. They feel abandoned. Well, let's look at another anonymized case example to illustrate. Roy always felt a pressure inside to be doing or thinking something. If he paused, he'd feel a terrible and discomforting state come over him. From the moment he woke up to when he went to sleep, he felt like he had to stay ahead of this feeling. Action in thought or deed was the only thing that seemed to work for him. Eventually, Roy grew to understand that the feeling he had been running from was that of abandonment. He and his therapist traced this to how unseen and uncared for he felt in his home growing up. His father was pathologically narcissistic and treated Roy as if he could not do anything right. His mother was emotionally uninvolved and paid him little attention. As Roy grew closer to his therapist and certain caring friends in his life, he was able to see how abandoned he had felt in relation to his parents. The second day, ashamed. Well, a scapegoat child who hangs on to their need to be cared for can land themselves in a world of shame. I'll define shame as intense self-loathing that makes us want to disappear in that moment. And we feel this when we think we have a need that deserves to get met but instead the person we want to meet that need responds as if we do not deserve this. That sudden switch from what was hoped for to what was found can be devastating to the child. This is what can result when the scapegoat child brings their emotional needs to their narcissistic parent. Let's go back to Roy to, to again illustrate. So Roy knew to never ask for anything for as long as he could remember. Despite this, he always worried that he required too much from others. He was a good employee at his company, but during performance reviews, he expected to be told that he needed too much help in order to get his work done. Although his supervisors never told him this, he just kept expecting it. When his partner would host parties, Roy didn't feel safe to pause and converse with the guests that he liked. He felt compelled to constantly check whether everyone had enough food or drink, and if nobody needed anything, he would identify and solve potential problems. In therapy, he and his therapist grew to understand how being useful to his guest helped stave off the feeling of shame he'd feel if he did what he wanted at these parties. He didn't feel like he deserved to do what he wanted and would feel intense shame if he went ahead and tried to do so. The third A, feeling astray. The scapegoat child who does not make themselves useful to their narcissistic parent can feel profoundly disoriented and astray. As painful as being close to the narcissistic parent is, it's also orienting. The scapegoat child knows what to anticipate and how to react when engaged with this parent. Since the narcissistic parent does not benignly stay in contact with the scapegoat child, when that child goes in their own direction, the child can feel painfully astray when they try to do this. In these moments, the child is psychologically lost without the hope of being found. Let's go back to Roy. He found it difficult to speak up in groups of people. He'd find himself letting others set the conversational agenda, even if he had something he wanted to discuss. He also had friends who seemed eager to talk more than listen to him. 
One day at work, Roy was in a meeting with three people who had always seemed to appreciate him and his point of view. One colleague asked Roy to share his thoughts about the project they were discussing because they were sure that he had some good ideas. As inviting as this seemed, Roy suddenly felt tongue-tied. His mind went blank and he didn't know what to say. He felt really astray. Well, staying psychologically close to their narcissistic parent protects the scapegoat child and later the survivor from these three A's. This means not expecting care from others and being useful to them instead. Doing this produces a less intense but ongoing dull pain that at least can be lived with. The three A's can be too disruptive to allow the scapegoat child or survivor to function in the moments when one of them rears up. So this picture illustrates the protective function of staying close to the narcissistic parent for the scapegoat child. The scapegoat survivor later has the internalized relationship of themselves as the undeserving and defective scapegoat child to the su supposedly superior and perfect parent. And that's represented by this diagram in the scapegoat survivor's mind here. As a result, the scapegoat survivor follows the green arrow towards narcissistically abusive friends and partners in order to avoid the three A's. The, those latter three A's are represented by these shark infested waters that stand between the survivor and safe people today. So in essence, if the scapegoat survivor moves towards narcissistically abusive people today, uh, they don't or are just somewhat protected from the three A's of feeling abandoned, ashamed, or astray. If they were to move towards the safe friends and partners today, they'd encounter uh, the three A's in a very intense fashion. And this is meant to illustrate what things can feel like as the scapegoat survivor begins to apply this pillar of recovery. The challenge of the second pillar. Well, the second pillar of recovery involves moving away from narcissistically abusive people and towards safe people. This allows the scapegoat survivor to reawaken their need to be cared for. As important as this is to heal, it can also be intensely challenging. Forsaking this need kept the scapegoat survivor and keeps them psychologically close to their narcissistic parent and therefore away from the three A's. Embracing this need can require the survivor to re-encounter the three A's. This time, however, there can be a different ending to these difficult states. The promise of the second pillar. Well, the scapegoat child had to avoid the three A's because there'd be no end to the pain involved. They were stuck with their narcissistic parent and could not get the care that would have truly mended these states. When the scapegoat survivor puts the second pillar of recovery into practice, there is a new hope. Now the safe other people they move towards can in fact offer the care that the survivor has been seeking all along. But this doesn't mean that the uh, scapegoat survival will not have to re-encounter the three A's. It does mean, though, that the re-encountering of these painful states can eventually yield to a quality of life that feels much safer and fulfilling. And here's how. First, the scapegoat survivor begins to notice who treats them well and who doesn't in their life. Next, they spend more time and energy with the latter and less with the former. Third, they begin to move away from the strategy of being useful to others and towards the new strategy of expecting care from them. Next, they feel some of the, the residuals of the three A's. They can feel ashamed, abandoned, or astray. Fifth, while they do encounter these three A's, they remain in connection to their new safe friends and partners. Next, these new ongoing connections gradually, emphasize gradually, inform the survivor that they can expect and get care as needed today. And finally, as the scapegoat survivor grows convinced of this new information, they can in fact tolerate the three A's more easily when they emerge, while also beginning and growing to see themselves as deserving and adequate. In short, the problem becomes the solution. Initially, safe others were sort of the problem because they needed to be avoided in order to, again, uh, avoid or protect oneself from the three A's, which would emerge if they uh, were pursued, if the safe people were pursued. As a scapegoat survivor applies 
uh, this pillar and moves towards safe people, the survivor gradually experiences the benefits. While being treated well, say, by a friend, they may also feel profoundly astray inside. But maybe this scapegoat survivor confides in their therapist how foreign it feels to be treated this way by this friend. And then perhaps their therapist helps them navigate this inner disorientation until they feel more stabilized with what things feel like with this friend. And over time, the scapegoat survivor may find themselves actually seeking this kind of treatment from this friend and others like this friend. So this picture illustrates the promise of the second pillar of recovery. Here, the scapegoat survivor moves away from the narcissistically abusive people as depicted by the fence around them. Then they traverse what used to be those shark infested waters towards safe people. But now the pangs of the three A's they encounter feel much more survivable. So instead of being represented by sharks, they're represented by these fish. The result is feeling protected from the feeling of going uncared for and reassured that they are cared for by the safe people in their life today. A resource to help you put the second pillar into practice in life. In my new course called the Empowerment Blueprint for Adult Scapegoat Survivors, I have a section devoted entirely to this topic. This course delivers eight specific life moves that reflect the three pillars of recovery. And here are the three life moves in the course that translate the second pillar of recovery into action. So in the course, the third life move challenges feelings of responsibility that scapegoat survivors may have for the emotional well-being of their narcissistic parent. And one of the obstacles to moving away from narcissistically abusive people today can be the intense guilt that is felt when doing so. But this guilt is actually premised on the notion that you are responsible for this person's emotional well-being. As adults, we can only be responsible for our own well-being in this regard, so this notion can be challenged in a, in a helpful way. This life move shows you how to apply what they call the three C's in your life, and those are you did not cause, you cannot control, nor can you cure your parents' pathological narcissism. The fourth life move in the course offers specific plans to find and get close to safe people. One of the hazards of moving away from narcissistically abusive people can be falling into sort of the trap of social isolation. It can just feel too scary to connect with new, hopefully safe people. You may not trust your own sense of who is safe and who is not. In this life move, you get to use what I refer to as the training wheels of psychotherapy and peer support groups to find acceptance and support. You can then apply what you experience and learn in these settings in choosing and enjoying relationships with safe people. The fifth life move in the course helps you set boundaries like the fence in the diagram around narcissistically abusive people today. Saying no was usually forbidden for a scapegoat child, and this can be why setting boundaries today can go right to the heart of the scapegoat survivor's traumatic past. This life move shows you how to set protective boundaries with people who mistreat you, but it also shows you how to set proactive boundaries with people who treat you well. That can be a particular challenge for scapegoat survivors because if, if they do feel uh, treated well by someone, it can feel as though they owe them an incredible debt of gratitude and better not offend them by um, setting boundaries or expressing their preferences when they don't align with the other persons. Well, I want to thank everyone for watching today's video and uh, again, your continued support uh, of the channel and, you know, again, courageous sharing of your own stories uh, in the comments and, of course, support with one another. Um, and so, yeah, I look forward to posting again next week uh, from uh, Brizo and myself. Uh, we'll see you then. Take care.